Great, thanks very much, Emily, and thanks for asking me to, uh, to take part in this webinar. Um, I'd like to start, if I may, by just reminding you uh, quickly what, what marginal gains are all about. Um, the, the, the principle of marginal gains was really first highlighted around 10 years ago, I guess, um, by a chap called Sir Dave Brailsford, who was the performance director for British, uh, the British cycling team. And as you can see from this quote, marginal, marginal gains is essentially the notion of improving every single component of a, of a system by a small amount. And although the individual improvements may themselves not be noticeable, when they're all added together, um, a, significant, a significant improvement can, can be achieved. Um, and, and this is represented graphically here, where you can see when, I guess, when you first start um, improving little things, nothing's very noticeable, but over time, all of these, uh, all of these small improvements add, add together. Um, and I think many of you um, will be aware of the unprecedented success that the British cycling team um, uh, has had in, re in recent years, much of which is attributed to that marginal gains approach. So what we're seeking to achieve in this series of webinars is to apply this approach, as Emily said, to the, to the IVF lab. And clearly there is an awful lot to think about here. Um, this article on, on the screen now by Don Riga suggests that there might be as many as 175 different laboratory factors that could influence outcome. So there's a lot to guard. In this particular webinar, we're going to concentrate on the importance um, and potential influence of dish preparation. But before I hand over to Dave, um, let's take a quick look at the results of the poll, um, which I think most of you now very kindly have, um, uh, have taken the time to respond to. And hopefully this will give us an idea of how embryologists are currently approaching uh, dish preparation. I, I'm, I'm slightly nervous because I've not, um, obviously I've no idea what people have put into this poll, but here, here we go. So, so question one, um, who most often undertakes this dish preparation? Um, and I guess that was kind of what I might have expected is that it tends to be the people who um, are, forgive the phrase, but a little lower down the tree. Uh, that tend to do the dish preparation. So it's, it seems, according to this poll, to be the, um, uh, the, the trainees, the practitioner support, um, and uh, none of the heads of labs uh, ever do any dish preparation, according to this, which is interesting. How many dishes are prepared at a time? Um, and I think what's interesting here is that although the majority will only pre prepare um, a relatively low number of dishes. There are some people out there who don't stipulate a limit. And I think that might be something that Dave will, will comment on. Does the operator wear sterile gloves during the dish preparation? Um, and this seems to be split about halfway with about half of the respondents never wearing gloves and half of the respondents always wearing gloves. And again, I think this is something which, uh, uh, which is of interest. Um, and then the way in which the dishes are actually prepared, whether they're done on a heated stage, whether you have your safety cabinets switched on or off. Um, uh, I, I think certainly not wishing to uh, preempt what Dave is going to say, but I, I think this is quite a reassuring answer to see in that the majority of people are doing it uh, on a heated stage, uh, but leaving the cabinet switched on while, while they do it. So that's great. And then the last answer, uh, I beg your pardon, the last question in relation to how often does the lab audit the, um, the actual procedure for dish preparation. Um, again, it's reassuring to see that the majority of people there are, um, are auditing their dish prep procedure at least annually. Um, but there, are, uh, there is a smattering of people doing it less frequently. And indeed, two people, um, it would appear on this poll, have never audited that dish preparation procedure. So I think that's, a, that's an interesting um, snapshot, perhaps, of what people are doing in relation to dish preparation. So I'll hand over to Dave now to, uh, to let, you tell you, let him tell you his thoughts. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, Dave. Well, welcome, everybody. Um, 
the the idea of today really as as steve has, has already highlighted is to take a look at the importance of the initial dish preparation and how that impacts the ongoing control of, of the culture system. And um, it's a principle really that applies uh, across all disciplines and endeavors, um, that time spent on preparation is always time uh, well spent, uh, as I always say when I'm asked to do any uh, DIY. Um, so this, this idea of preparing properly is, is really essential. And when it comes to um, preparation of culture dishes, the key areas that might be of importance are really around minimizing the risk of contamination, um, establishing and controlling the culture conditions and maintaining the integrity of the micro drops, assuming that most labs now use micro drops rather than uh, large volumes. And what I'd like to do is quickly go through each of these um, in turn. We, we would, I think, all accept and understand that we should take all reasonable um, steps to ensure the culture system is not prone to contamination. Um, and this must include measures during dish preparation. And having looked through the scientific literature, it, it, it appears that we really have little or no clear idea of the true incidence of contamination in our culture systems. And um, the paper uh, shown here with the table um, is uh, from a paper from 2007 from Castrop and colleagues, where they did a, 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 a systematic um, examination of, of bacterial contamination in their culture and, and reported an instance in their lab at least of 0.7% of cycles showing some level of contamination. And uh, what they also said is that they made clear that this was the, um, this instance related to the obvious bacterial contamination. Um, and there may well be occult contamination and that rate is entirely unknown. What they found that was that most of the infections were um, Candida or uh, E. coli, uh, usually from the patients. And in those circumstances, as indicated here, most of those that came through for repeat cycles still had uh, infections with 73% of the E. coli infections actually being resistant to antibiotics. It's worth noting that the, the study was done when penicillin and streptomycin were the predominant antibiotics using, used in embryo culture. Um, and the switch to gentamicin uh, gives a broader spectrum of antibiotic cover that may mean this data isn't um, as directly ap applicable as we would have liked. But the bottom line, I think, is, is this um, quote at the bottom that no explanation could be found regarding um, whether this was due to bad practice during oven pickup or laboratory procedures. And what I want to focus on is, is how we avoid um, introducing any uh, microbiological contamination by making sure actually our lab laboratory procedures are, are uh, optimized. And I think we should recognize from the outset that IVF systems tend not to operate in a sterile environment and, and that, that, that's virtually impossible to achieve. But what we can do is introduce appropriate um, measures. And the first of those um, is preparation of dishes in a clean work area with filtered air. So uh, the sort of workstations that we now uh, working can have uh, HEPA filtration, but they can also have VOC filtration. So taking out particulates um, as well as volatile organic uh, compounds. But of course, the key, the key point here is that the workstations uh, will only filter the air if they're switched on. Um, and uh, the, the one of the things we've uh, noticed when we when we visit labs is that some labs will switch off workstations when um, preparing dishes because of concerns about the impact of airflow on the, the media. And I'll come back to that in a later slide. 
It's also worth stating that a clear and clean work area will help. And that means decluttering, keep it free of clutter as, a, as an ideal starting point so that the filtered air actually has a, a, a maximal impact. We also need to consider what we as, as the embryologists and the operators um, do and where. And we will often talk about uh, aseptic technique, which is um, what we would use if we were um, performing um, tissue, uh, uh, tissue culture. But actually our practices um, don't really meet the standards of aseptic technique. Not many labs that I see will wipe down um, the bottles of medium with alcohol and then leave it to off gas. They don't um, flame the open um, uh, bottle to uh, keep the, 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 the rim clean. So we're more akin to clean technique, um, which is a, a step down and is, is common practice across um, medical disciplines. It's worth saying that we should um, be more aware of this and, and perhaps pr have training provided to make sure that we understand the differences between clean and aseptic technique. But I think the important thing around dish preparation um, is that in applying clean technique, um, first of all, we should clean the area where the dishes are being prepared and that should be kept meticulously clean rather than peeping, people dipping in and out. Uh, and the operator themselves should take appropriate steps. And I consider that as meaning wearing um, a hat, a mask and gloves, preferably sterile. And consideration should be given at least to also wearing sleeves um, because of the potential risk of um, uh, shedding from, from the forearms during uh, dish preparation. So much like we would, for example, when we're doing tubing for um, PGT, um, we take those extra precautions for cleanliness. And I think that should be applied when we're preparing dishes. And as well as the bacterial contamination, um, we should consider the volatile organic compounds that I mentioned and the need for off-gassing. Um, plastic wear is usually made of polystyrene and they can emit styrene uh, as a vapor. Um, so uh, consideration should be given to, to off-gassing all of the dishes before they're pre prepared. And the period of off-gassing can be determined by monitoring and validating that with a VOC meter. Now, ideally off-gassing would be done in a laminar flow in an in a area away from the main laboratory. That's not always feasible, but that would be the ideal um, situation. Some products are completely uh, airtight wrapped in plastic. Some products have gas permeable packaging and that's worth um, considering. Um, also just flagging up, reduced oxygen in the incubators may have a, 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 an effect of reducing the possible toxic effect of VOCs. So if you're still using atmospheric oxygen uh, levels, then um, this is something that might be even more important. The other thing that we uh, want to think about in um, dish preparation is how we handle the medium. And many of you will have seen this graph before from Jason Swain's paper um, from 2012, demonstrating the impact of increased osmolality on mouse embryo development and showing nice, nicely that if you get above certainly 300 milliosmoles per kilogram in your culture medium, um, mouse embryo uh, development dr drops off quite radically. And what um, Jason Swain um, also reported was that the osmolality in uh, microdrops can change rapidly during microdrop preparation, so the preparation of the dishes. So these, um, these uh, uh, data show really nicely how the conditions in which we prepare dishes have an impact on osmolality even after five minutes. So these were dishes that were prepared and osmolality uh, checked almost immediately. And that the key messages here are that the, the airflow 
has no significant impact. So we should have the airflow on to maintain that cleanliness that I've mentioned. Um, heat has a, an issue, so we should set up on an unheated uh, area. Um, and that uh, drop size has a significant effect. And you can see here that 10 microliter drops are far more risky um, when we prepare drops compared to 20 and 40 microliters, for example. Uh, and interestingly, and I don't know how well, um, uh, how widely used this is, a, an underlay technique is protective. In other words, if you make the dishes, um, dispense the drops, overlay with oil, then take the original drops off out and replace that medium with fresh medium, um, that is protective. And I'm not sure how widely that's used. We also um, know that in terms of uh, setup, the uh, volume of oil added at preparation affects the longer term control of conditions. Um, and using a maximum volume of oil in the dish uh, without risking oil sealing where the, the oil um, travels around the rim of the dish and prevents gas exchange. Um, Avoiding that, but having the maximum amount of oil provides the best protection. And now we gen generally recommend a minimum of two millimeters depth of oil above the um, surface of the mica drops. So that's for the longer term. Um, we also increasingly have become aware of uh, the role of more viscous oils. So, we know oils generally will minimize water loss. That's potentially a, an issue more specifically when using dry incubators. Um, but uh, the type of oil might also play a role. And data that we have um, from in-house testing shows a protective effect of the heavier or more viscous uh, oils as seen here where um, over uh, 192 hours, so eight days of, of culture, the uh, lifeguard heavy oil actually showed a, a lower increase in osmolality over eight days than the lighter or standard oils. Uh, also worth mentioning that in terms of dish preparation, we need to think not only of the actual uh, technicalities of preparing the dishes, but how we equilibrate those dishes before they're used. Um, and again, um, Jason Swain has published nice data uh, from this paper from 2010, um, talking about the three stages of um, uh, setup of dishes, with the equilibration phase being um, uh, the point at which you set up the dish to the point that it's reached uh, the set point for pH. And the set point typically will be that pH, the external pH that we're aiming for of around 7.3. And then the stabilization, stabilization phase is uh, during use when uh, incubators might be opened and so on, where fluctuations can typically be seen. And it's important to remember that the time for equilibration will depend on the surface area, um, the type of oil overlay, because the heavier oils, uh, whilst perhaps being more protective, will also require a longer equilibration time. Uh, the type of dish, and I'll come on to that in the next slide, the starting pH and the set point pH. And by starting pH, remember that previously open bottles of media will see a level of off-gassing, which means their pH will be slightly higher than a freshly opened bottle of medium, so require a slightly longer uh, equilibration time. And work from um, uh, Steele and Conahan reported some years ago, uh, suggested that actually a minimum of 10 hours would, would be an appropriate time. And we generally say um, overnight. Um, ideally, you would validate that in your own lab. So, um, when it comes to the type of dish, uh, one of the things that comes into play is um, how we keep the micro drops um, in, in good shape. Um, and one of the things that comes into play is the hydrophobic or hydrophilic nature of the surface of the dish. 
and, and that can determine how much a, a dish uh, spreads and that can be important because as shown here all of these drops are 50 microliters and if you have a, a 50 microliter micro drop that spreads over six uh, millimeter diameter then its surface area will be around 52 square millimeters whereas if the spreading is greater and it goes to nine millimeters that's extreme but um, uh, that will be nearer to 71 millimeters. And we know that the surface area of the drop is a significant factor in the rate of osmolality change over extended and uninterrupted culture. Now, importantly, if you compare that to a well dish, and I've just taken the embryo GPS dish as an example, here a 50 microliter drop in a well that has a diameter of just over five millimeters will actually have a surface area of 21 square millimeters. So that's a 40% of the surface area of a drop um, that is not in a well that spreads over six millimeters. So not much more than the well. And that potentially has a significant effect on the rate at which osmolality might change. So that's a quick whiz through and just to summarize the key considerations I think when preparing dishes for culture are that we should be scrupulous with cleanliness, the cleanliness of the work area, but also of the operator with using gloves and sleeves potentially. Um, leave the airflow on. We know that if, if you handle things properly, that is a, a positive rather than negative as shown by the Jason Swain data. Um, be aware of the possible effect of reusing open bottles, particularly over extended periods. Um, you might want to test whether plastics need off-gassing. And um, be aware that osmolality can change significantly during the setup of microdrops. So not during the culture period, but during that few minutes that you're preparing the dish. And absolutely critically, do not set up on a heated stage. You might want to consider the underlay technique. We know that's protective. It uses more medium, but we're talking about marginal gains and that um, requires some, um, some investment, if you like. It's a relatively small volume, but um, it, it does make a difference. Um, you might want to consider using lar larger drops or other precautions, particularly if you're down at the 10 um, 10 to 20 microliter micro drop range. Um, the rate of change of osmolality is influenced by the surface area to volume ratio. And that, as indicated, that can be reduced using preformed wells um, and use the maximum possible volume oil, of oil, um, whatever system you're using and consider the type used. So the more viscous oils um, can, could well be protective. And finally, remember that you, you need to allow enough time for full equilibration. So I'll just end with another quote from Robert Schuller uh, to say that spectacular achievement is always preceded by unspectacular preparation. So this isn't a glamorous part of embryology, but I, I hope I've made um, uh, some impression on you that the attention to detail at this um, important first step is critical. Uh, those are my references and uh, I'll just say uh, thank you and uh, um, thanks for your attention. Fabulous, thank you very much Dave. Um, we have time for a few questions. We've had a few submitted but if you'd like to keep them coming in we'll address any questions that you have. First question, how long can a bottle of oil be kept in a warmer and an incubator? And is it also two weeks that it can be kept from the day it was opened? Dave, perhaps you'd like to comment on that one. Um, let's take the open shelf life first, because that would normally be stipulated by the, the manufacturer. Um, the, uh, the, the, the general rule there is that it relates less to the um, the the absolute expiry date of the product and more related to the testing that's performed to validate it. Um, so uh, it, it may be two weeks, it may be one week, but um, that's really related to the uh, testing that underpins its registration. 
Um, how long can an oil, uh, oil stay in an incubator? Um, well, oil can be used in uninterrupted culture over six or seven days. Um, my general advice would be that if you're intending to use it for culture for seven days, uh, I would use it fresh from the bottle rather than it being warmed for, for any time um, before the culture period. Um, and, and that is more um, anecdotal and opinion than, than anything I could actually say is, is entirely evidence-based. I don't know whether Steve has a, a view on that. Um, well, other, other than the fact that I think clinics need to follow the instructions for use uh, for these products and, and to do that fairly, um, fairly rigorously, because by not doing that, um, then should anything go wrong in that treatment cycle and the instructions for use haven't been followed, um, I've certainly come across cases where that has then led to quite difficult um, legal situations for the clinics. So, uh, yeah, follow, follow the instructions for use, I think. Mm, always sensible advice. Keeping on, on the theme of, of oil, it's very topical to talk about heavy oils at the moment, but how do we define a heavy oil, Dave? What's your definition? Yeah, that, that, that's an interesting one, because if you look at the, the um, densities of, of the different oils, they're not massively different. So that the heavy oil, for example, the lifeguard is, is um, heavier than the liquid paraffin, um, for example but it's not hugely different, but the viscosity is quite different. Um, and I can't remember the absolute um, figures, but they're not, they're not hugely different, um, but they are he slightly heavier and certainly more viscous. And what's interesting with the heavy oils is that they um, appear to uh, be protective in as far as that they slow down the rate of temperature and pH changes when you're outside the incubator. So for example, they're often used when you're doing micromanipulation because you're out of the incubator for longer. Um, and they seem to slow down the transit of gases and VOCs through the, the oil layer, um, which is why if you use them, you do have to factor in potentially longer equilibration times. Mm, yeah, thank you for that. Um, question here about the potential toxicity of gloves. Steve, perhaps you, this is one you can comment on. Yeah, I think the, this is an interesting dilemma that embryologists have. Um, wearing gloves, as Dave has mentioned, from a, um, a contamination point of view is clearly a good thing to do, uh, particularly if you're able to use sterile gloves. But that needs to be balanced against two things. Firstly, the, the potential loss of dexterity by wearing a pair of gloves. Um, some sets of gloves, obviously, as people know, fit better than others, but um, that, that's something to consider. And then, of course, there, is, there are sets of gloves out there that are potentially toxic, um, that have, have a high latex component in them. Um, and I think the, uh, the way around this is, is to test the gloves, is, is to actually do some form of toxicity testing on the gloves, which can be, can be achieved reasonably easily in-house um, by exposing the you know, little bits of the gloves to, uh, to sperm and, and, and looking at the effects there. Um, I think that's a fairly widely, certainly in, the, in andrological uh, forum, that's a fairly widely uh, accepted way of doing that. So, yeah, I mean, I, I guess my view would be it, it is better to wear gloves from a contamination point of view, um, particularly at the moment as well, of course. And um, uh, but ensure that you're not inadvertently introducing something which actually is even worse um, in, in terms of toxicity. There are some gloves I know that can um, that can exert their toxic effect through plastics. They are so toxic. So be careful and, and take sensible precautions, I think, if you if you want to use gloves. Thank you. Okay. If I could advice. just chip in on that, Emily, we we used um, nitrile gloves when when I was um, working in Leeds, and we um, we wore them pretty much every time we handled um, embryo dishes. And I understand this concern about reduced 
dexterity, but um, I don't know whether there's anybody on the, on the line from, from the Leeds unit, but certainly when we um, started using gloves um, almost routinely, I don't think it proved particularly difficult. It, it, it's a, a bit of a hurdle to get across, but as Steve says, if you choose the right gloves, actually it works quite well. Lovely, thank you. Um, question here about airflow. So when you say airflow on, in my old clinic, we always had the workflow on half flow rather than full flow for all procedures and dish prep. Should they, should they always be on full rate airflow for dish prep? That's one we didn't think as an option in the poll there, Steve, having it on a half flow. No, 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 we didn't. Um, my understanding is that you should use the cabinet switched on properly and, and not at half flow. Um, half flow is generally, or certainly when you go, when you look at other areas of, of tissue culture and clean rooms, they put the cabinets onto half flow overnight to have a background cleaning effect um, rather than switching them off completely. But to get the full, um, the, the full HEPA filtration of the air, um, I would suggest they need to be switched on full. And as Dave shown in, in his in his slide with um, with Jason Swain's work, that airflow isn't going to cause an increase in, in evaporation markedly. So you're not doing any damage by having it on full, other than I guess using a bit more electricity. Great. So if they're on, switch them on fully. Being the answer to that one. Yeah. Um, another question here: Is it better to set up the ICSI dishes with pre-warmed oil or with cold oil? Dave, what do you think about that? Uh, that that really depends on um, other factors. I think there's there's a myriad of different ways of setting up ICSI dishes. Um, so I think it depends on whether you take the approach of setting up your ICSI dishes shortly before the ICSI. So in which case you would warm the oil, warm the medium, warm the dishes set up and then put them back into a warming oven for 15 to 30 minutes before you use them. Um, in which case, inevitably, the, the oil is pre-warmed. Um, if you do things slightly differently uh, and, and set up your ICSI dishes even the day before, um, you, might, uh, you might choose to uh, set up the whole thing cold. So that there isn't a straightforward answer to that. It depends on how you set up and how you logistically manage the exit procedure, I think, and, and the preparation of dishes for it. Thank you, Steve. Any thoughts on that one? Um, no, I'd agree, I'd agree with Dave. Um, I think if you if you if you are a lab that um, is setting your dishes up just before the procedure, then surely you know you don't. The worst thing in the world would be that they were cold. Um, so pre-warm media would be better, but there's no point doing that if you're setting them up the day before. Lovely, thank you. Um, question here, anti, an, is the antimicrobial in the media not effective against the common microbial contaminants in the cultures? How can we still record contamination in some cases in conventional IVF? Dave, what's your, what's your answer to that one? Well, as I mentioned, the, the, the switch to gentamicin as a wider spectrum antibiotic certainly provides more cover. Um, but I think anyone working in, in an IVF lab is aware of the odd occasion when um, transmission through either from the, the, the semen sample or from egg collection, you can still overload that with, with um, microbial contamination. And the... Um, you know, there will still be some risk of uh, gentamicin resistant um, uh, organisms growing. Uh, and bear in mind, one of the things that we, we tend to focus in on the bacterial contamination, the yeasts um, and, and some of the, the fungi and the likes won't, won't be affected by that. So we, whilst we tend to think about the bacterial contaminants, we also need to think about the others. Uh, and, and things like yeasts will be slow growing um, and they may not um, impact embryos adversely. Um, but I would still argue that we would want to um, take steps where possible to avoid those getting into the system. Mm. Anything from you, Steve, on that one? Well, well, firstly, I'm not a microbiologist, so um, no. <laughs> I wouldn't pretend to 
to, to understand this in great detail. But yeah, I mean, my understanding is that gentamicin is a fairly broad spectrum antibiotic and it'll, it, it'll have an effect on most things. But I think the important point here is that it's not a replacement for good aseptic or good clean technique or aseptic technique, even when, when the dishes are being set up. You can't rely on the fact that there's an antibiotic there to guard against sloppy technique. Okay, we've got we've got one last question. We'll make this our last one. Uh, would the airflow effect depend on how many dishes were being made at one time? And is there any suggestions for how many micro drops dishes without wells to make at once? Steve, you'd like to go first on that one? Yeah, very much so. Um, and I, I guess this this is the point um, is that it is tempting, and I've seen this happen. It's tempting for people, particularly in large centres where they have lots of dishes to set up um, for um, for the embryologists to, uh, in, in an attempt to be efficient, to, to you know, set out rows and rows of dishes to drop all, put all the micro drops in. And then um, once they've done that, to get the, get the oil and pipette the oil over the top of all of them. Absolutely, if you do that with a large number of drops, then, then for sure the ones that were set up first are going to be suffer more suffering from more evaporation than those set up last and last and airflow under those circumstances will have an effect. But um, yeah, I mean, I, you know, this this depends on on the individual needs of the lab. But but the principle is is set up um, fewer far fewer dishes than far more dishes. I wouldn't necessarily like to put a number on it, but I don't know whether you do, Dave. Uh, well, I, I, I mean, I think. The, the, the optimal would be to do them one at a time, but, but practically that, that becomes difficult. Um, you're right, putting a number on it is, is a little bit dangerous, I guess, but I mean, I'd be reluctant to do more than two at a time. Um, but, it, but it also feeds into what else you're doing. So um, for example, if you were using an underlay technique, so you were taking those initial drops out, replacing them with fresh medium, you will get away with doing two or three rather than one at a time, for example, I suspect. Um, but that's, that's the sort of thing that um, labs might try to uh, have a look at and, and, and potentially validate if they have access to osmometers. And the, the important thing isn't, I'm sure you agree, David, is to get the oil over the micro drops because that then immediately um, provides that that protective effect yeah, rather absolutely. than setting up a load of dishes and then adding the oil to all of them you know it's a this is a classic example of a marginal gain it isn't difficult to change your procedure to to add oil more regularly to the drops during setup hmm. thank you both and, and thank you very much to our audience today for all those really good questions it's been some really good super questions that have come through today um, if there are any lab or theatre procedures or aspects of these procedures that you would like us to cover in particular during these marginal gain series, please do let us know. You can either contact your account manager or you can email us at customerserviceuk at coopersurgical.com. Uh, thank you very much, Dave and Steve. And if you've enjoyed what you've heard today, then you'll likely be interested in our webinar, How to Evaluate a Culture Media. And we've got a number of customers who are joining us to talk about their experiences undertaking culture media evalu evaluations. This is on 18th of March at 12.30. If you'd like more information on this and many the, the many other webinars that we run, please send an email to our customer services team. That email address is customerserviceuk at coopersurgical.com. They'll sign up for our fortnightly bulletin and then you can hear about all of our events. So it just remains for me to say thank you so very much for joining us today. It's been a pleasure to have your company. Thank you again for all those questions and we'll look forward to seeing you soon. Bye. <laughs>